I want to thank uh, Dr. Dr. Nonneman and Dr. Anthony for their, their talks. It really sets us up well for my topic, which will be on respirators. And I've kind of got it the sub, subtitle of Answers to Common Questions. And uh, I'm associate professor here at Ag Systems Technology and uh, College of Agricultural and Applied Sciences at Utah State University. Uh, really excited to be here with you today and talk a little bit about agricultural safety. Um, so setting this all up, uh, I'm going to move this out of the way here. Um, my objectives in my talk today, you're almost done, so don't worry. You have about uh, a couple a couple slides to go, and we'll, we'll wrap this up. But we want to review the use and selection of respirators uh, considered effective for particulate matter. Now, to get us started here, let's uh, consider the question, why would you even need a respirator? And I like this little... A meme here that says holding your breath is totally unnecessary. Well, when you think about it, um, how long does it take uh, someone to become um, ill or, 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 or pass away or die from lack of food? How long will it take for somebody, if you didn't have food, how long would it take for them to die? I know it's kind of a morbid thing to talk about, but you know, usually that's about, if you put it in the comment box, usually you know, a couple weeks maybe, a couple of days, depends on the body score condition or, and things like that. So think about this. Well, how long does it take for somebody to die from dehydration if they don't drink water, if they don't have water, they dehydrate? You think about that, some people talk about it, you know, you know maybe a, a day or two. Uh, it really depends on the conditions, you know, it's, it can vary, you know, it can be really hot, uh, really dry. Uh, but then we talk about well, how long can somebody survive uh, by without air, you know, without oxygen. And we think about that. I mean, all workers should deserve a, a, a place to uh, go to work safely and ensure that their uh, quality of life continues on. And we've talked a lot about acute and chronic type illnesses. And so what we're going to talk about today is those key things that can help uh, ensure the quality of life of workers as they enter livestock buildings and work around those those hazards that we found and have identified with uh, Matt and uh, Renee's topics today. So another question is, well, why would you use it? Well, what's the use of a respirator? Um, well, for, for one, each respirator is specific for a particular hazard. Now, that's really important for us to determine the type and exposure in our first assessment of uh, using a respirator. If we need to use a respirator, we need to know what those hazards are and uh, Dr. Anthony and Dr. Nonamond have talked a lot about those. And when we look at that, we are going to evaluate our atmosphere. And I've got a picture here where we talk about uh, the different, comparing the different sizes of uh, particulates. If you can look here, we can see when we talk about uh, particulate matter 2.5, you can see it's 2.5 or smaller uh, microns. There's less than 2.5 microns. And then you have the human hair. So this kind of gives us a, a kind of a perspective about what that hazard is, respirable dust can be. And uh, we also want to evaluate the atmosphere. Do we have a sufficient, sufficient oxygen? Um, a lot of folks uh, need to know that, you know, you want to have a above 21% oxygen or at least 21% oxygen uh, so that we are not uh, immediately uh, hazardous or, or dangerous to life. Uh, in, the at, uh, in that condition. So those kinds of atmospheres without sufficient oxygen are, are immediately dangerous and hazardous to life. Uh, suppose also, also those uh, toxic gases that we might find like hydrogen sulfide, which only takes a couple seconds for someone to succumb to that type of toxic gas. There are also sometimes fumes from paints or, or sprays, uh, vapors and things like we might see in pesticide applications. And then there are those particulates that we're going to talk about. And before I get too far in that, I want to stress to everyone on the presentation that PPE is your last line of defense. Now you can see here on this slide, we have a hazard and that's represented by our dust. And we have a kind of an onion layer. I and mean, you know, have you heard of the hierarchy of controls, right? So PPE is that last layer of defense before it gets to that person. Now, other things that we've talked about in our presentation so far have been ventilation, 
uh, which can be an administrative control. We want to ventilate when we're working around uh, or moving cows or, or feeding, those kinds of things if we can ventilate. Now, if we think about hierarchy of controls as kind of a layer uh, or an onion where we can peel back those layers, the more layers we have, the harder it is for that hazard to interact with that person. So we could do things like substitute uh, feed that could be, uh, that could be less dusty. Uh, we, could make we could add additives. Uh, we could also eliminate the need to be in the building uh, during a particular activity or changing out a certain feed. We can just go ahead and just remove that person or eliminate the hazard uh, from interacting with that person. So remember that PPE is your last line of defense. So we wanna make sure that we use it properly. And with that, we wanna make sure that people understand that when you put on a respirator, those respirators can present a hazard for certain folks. We wanna make sure that person's evaluated to ensure that it doesn't present a hazard to their breathing or respiratory tract. I know we talked a lot about uh, those dusts and different things that can, your respiratory tract can kind of filter out. You know, your respiratory tract is a really amazing uh, thing. And we want to make sure that when you put it on, if you have an underlying health condition, that it doesn't cause you uh, problems in breathing. It doesn't make you claustrophobic. So it's important to get a medical clearance through a physician or a healthcare provider. So anytime you're wearing a tight fitting respirator, which we're going to talk about what those are in just a minute, it, you need to make sure that you're, they're not going to cause a problem for you to breathe. Okay. So then the next question I get sometimes is what do we need to do? What do we need to look for in a respirator? Well, first off, I wanna talk about the approval of a respirator. When you look at NIOSH, NIOSH goes through extensive testing of respirators to make sure they do what they say they're going to do. And they give a lot of designations and, and make sure that the terminology that you read off that uh, piece of information from that respirator manufacturer, that it's gonna do what you want it to do. And so we want to look for a TC approval number. We want to look for NIOSH emblem or logo. And we want to look for that designation of the filter. And we kind of talk about those in just a moment where we see N95, N99, N100. All right, so let's get started here with talking a little bit more about what those terms mean. Well, filtering, there are three big categories of respirators. So when we're selecting them, we want to know what, they, what we want them to do. Do we want them to filter? Do we want to purify? Or do we want to supply an, uh, an atmosphere for us? For in the filtering, we can look at, we're looking particular, <laughs> particular, particular, taha. So we have those N, R, and P. What do those mean? Well, sometimes your particulates can have an oil mist in the air with it. So when that comes, it saturates the, the filter medium and it becomes less efficient and can cause uh, a hazard. So we want to make sure if we have oil mist in the air with particulates that we use a strongly oil resistant and that's designated by a P. Now the 95, 99, or 99.97 or 100%, those indicate the filtering efficiency. So looking at those classifications. Now, we'll have cartridges which are specific to its particular gas, vapor, or fumes, and those are typically used with elastomeric, and I'll talk more about those in just a moment. Atmosphere supplying can either provide air in a self-contained unit, like a SCBA, a self-contained breathing apparatus, which provides clean atmosphere oxygen that's sufficient for you to do the work you need to do. Typically, we see firefighters or folks that may have to enter a confined space with uh, low, low oxygen, uh, but there are permit requirements like having an observer, all these other things that you wanna make sure to consider if you're going into a confined space. Um, there are other atmospheres supplying where you have a line from a outside source that provides clean air through a line to uh, the individual and not just a contained unit, which is a limited supply if you're using an SCBA or self-contained breathing apparatus. Okay, so let's get into those. each one of those. We're looking at uh, uh, filtering face piece or FFRs, uh, where you where we consider these disposable particulate filtering respirators. You can see these guys here. One may have them installed backwards, but we really want the guy on, uh, the, guy on the right to look there is we've got a tight fitting uh, a respirator and it seals off across the face so that it provides that seal to prevent from particulates from coming in to the respiratory zone. So sometimes these uh, respirators will have a, an exhaust valve or exhalation valve and you can see that in the middle. That little valve allows us to have reduce the moisture buildup or the humidity you might feel inside the respirator or prevent your safety glasses from fogging up. 
Okay. The next type we talked just a minute ago about was elastomeric or a full, or it could be full face or half face piece respirators. These are typically used with a cartridge and they're typically used, you know, when you have fumes or vapors that need to be uh, purified out of the air as it comes into the breathing area of the individual. Sometimes these are used in combination with a filtering media where you can put on a, an additional filtering media with the cartridge to filter out particulates as it's, and makes it a little more efficient. Now the full face uh, and the half piece, uh, they're both elastomeric, meaning they're reusable. So we'll talk a little more about how specific, those specific things are in dealing with the um, care and use of those. The next one I wanna talk about are the powered air purifying respirators or PAPRs. These uh, units you can see in the gentleman in the middle where you see he's grinding. Uh, we have this uh, portable machine that's kind of attached to the individual and it pulls air and filters that and blows it over the blue breathing zone of the individual. Now these are considered loose fitting and you can see that you have a, a hood like more of a, like a welder helmet or even a, a kind of a bag type hood that allows the, the breathing zone to be directed with the filtered air. Now let's talk a little bit about how we care for each of those. Now um, I wanna make sure if we're using reusable that we assign specific people with a specific respirator. When we have that, we wanna make sure to disinfect it after the use and clean that and make sure we store it properly uh, for reuse. We don't wanna share respirators. If we do share respirators, we wanna make sure that they're clean and disinfected for the next use. So we would use sanitation uh, to wipe the uh, areas where it contacts the face and using uh, soap and water, a mild detergent to clean and, and disinfect those elastomeric type respirators. Now we don't wanna store them uh, by hanging them on a nail inside the livestock barn. Uh, we, we wanna make sure we give them proper storage and keep them out from contaminants. And when we're working with them, we wanna make sure to wash our hands if we're gonna don and doff or take on and off those, those respirators, we wash our hands because you're going to expose your face to whatever it is on your hands. So making sure we have proper storage and cleaning is important. The next part of the question is like, can I have a beard with uh, my respirator? And I love this guy's picture because I really uh, desire to grow a mustache like this, but I get the nicks uh, from my significant other, like I really can't do that. Uh, but I think it's pretty sweet. Um, I think we should all go back to kind of like those really cool mustaches. Uh, but sometimes those facial hairs, even a five o'clock shadow can block and lift off the seal of that tight fitting respirator. So we wanna make sure to remove those facial hairs because if that lifts off from the face and limits the tight fitting seal around the breathing zone, then we are actually leaving a straight, a nice highway interstate into the breathing zone for those contaminants. So even a five o'clock shadow, so making sure your workers shave, uh, even those five o'clock shadows or limit their facial hair to inside uh, the respirator and it's not, not coming in contact with that uh, seal. Sometimes folks need to wear eyeglasses. So there are adapt adaptations or accessories that you can use with certain respirators that can add eye, uh, for prescriptive lenses with like full face uh, respirators as well. So when we don or doft or when we get a select the respirators, we understand the use and what those are selected for, but fit assessment and user seal check. So a lot of folks misunderstand what a fit assessment and user seal check means. So one is done uh, yearly or anytime there might be a significant change to the person's uh, face where they either they've changed their facial shape, they have a uh, surgery or things that may cause a distortion or change in their facial features. And the other one is uh, user seal check, which we should do each time we put on uh, the respirator. So it's, we have two types of fit assessments that we can do. One is qualitative, where we use taste like uh, sugary uh, taste or a bitter taste, where it's used to, to see if the fa face piece or is filtering that uh, particulate out and you're not able to taste it. Sometimes those things you can't taste or if you have problems with taste, that quali qualitative fit test may not be the best uh, choice to do a fit assessment. Well, what we're doing with a fit assessment 
is making sure that whenever we're using that respirator, whether we're talking, whether we're working, we're bending down, turning around, there are, there are it's still making that face, uh, that seal around the face. So there's uh, quite a bit of a lockstep protocol that which we need to follow to make sure that if you speak to another coworker or if you bend down, that that respirator does not come loose from your face and loosen that seal so it doesn't break the seal. So in this picture here, we have a, quali a quantitative uh, fit assessment with a TC Porter count where it's counting the particulates inside the mask versus outside the mask and doing a mathematic calculation where it compares that and determines if the seal is good on your respirator, if it's filtering out. Now, sometimes when you eat before you go do a fit testament assessment, uh, those particulates in your, in your breath can cause you to fail. So that's why I have that sandwich. And, and also you can't eat with a respirator on. So using a user seal check, anytime you take it off and put it back on, you wanna make sure that you have assessed that it's on your face properly and you quickly do a breath in and a breath out where you're checking any leaks around that tight fitting seal on your face. So each time you put on a respirator, you wanna make sure to use, do that user seal check and if you're going to select a tight fitting respirator, you should probably be make sure that it's actually doing the job you need it to do on your face. So here's an example of a uh, elastomeric uh, user seal check where it covers the exhalation valve, uh, valve and then also the inhalation. And then it has two different types. One's a cartridge type in figure nine, one's a, a disc type uh, particulate on figure 10. Now, how do I put it on and off? Well, you've got uh, a couple different things you wanna make sure you do is you don't wanna expose your face to any contaminants on your hands, so make sure to wash your hands. Wash them for 20 seconds with soap and water vigorously. You know, make sure that, you know, there's a lot of good videos about washing your hands and, and one of those is you know, showing shoe polish on somebody's hand when you uh, scrub your hands. You wanna make sure to get all that good stuff uh, taking off of your hands before you start to put on and off those respirators. Uh, so what we make sure to do is to use both straps properly. We want to put it on our face and adjust our nose piece uh, using two fingers, uh, pressing simultaneously and evenly across that nose piece. A lot of people will take their thumb and their forefinger. I know I'm, I'm guilty of this and I'll just go like this and I'll squeeze it. Well, your thumb is a different strength than your finger. And so a lot of times we'll get an uneven squeeze and you know, one side will be like really inside and the other will be kind of okay. And so when we're taking it off, we wanna remove it by the straps and not touch the front of the face mask because that is gonna contaminate your hand. So using the straps to uh, remove your face mask or your, your respirator. Anytime you require um, the use of a, of a respirator, you should be trained on the features of that respirator. You should see what it's capable of doing, what's the limitation, how to put it on, how to make the adjustment and how to care for it. You also want to make sure that people are aware of those hazards and why you need to wear that respirator. So important to include training anytime you want to have people wear respirators. A lot of times we get a lot of questions about where can I get these? Well, it used to, you could probably find some in hardware stores or search Google or even find them on Granger's. But there's a lot out there now that we've, we've uh, shifted those uh, stockpiles over to healthcare professionals. So we're also making sure that pesticide applicators, as well as those that are working in, in hazardous atmospheres still have access in agriculture to those. And so there's a, AgriSafe is hosting a how do we, a webinars on how we might procure uh, PPE. There's also uh, information on our websites uh, from uh, High Cause about uh, where you might uh, care and, and use of respirators working in agriculture. You, you wanna make sure that you, you've identified uh, those features. I mean, there's all, it's gonna be really tough. There's letters that have been sent to uh, uh, the administration about purchasing, uh, but it's pretty, pretty difficult right now to get our hands on certain things, but uh, a lot of times we see that more, more often the elastomeric uh, respirators are available more often than the disposable or um, filter, face piece, uh, fil filtering face piece respirators. Well, with that, here's my contact information. I really appreciate your time. Uh, thank you for joining us and don't hold your breath. Here's some resources from 3M, CDC, uh, Utah Asthma Task Force, and our U.S. Agricultural Safety and Health Centers. We have a YouTube channel. Check it out. There's a lot of great videos on respirators there.